So preaching psalms today. Preaching psalms is a challenge, and I thought I'd take on a challenge. Many of us in our heart of hearts hope that God will immunize us from pain and from vulnerability. The writer of this psalm today is inclined towards that same tendency. It is good news that we are all free to offer of our needs to God without censoring ourselves. The psalm and all of their grit and challenge offer that freedom. But in doing so, we also affirm that God does not protect us from every harm, but also does not place us in harm's way either. Instead, God is present with us in our pit and even has the power to draw us out of the pit. But a life of discipleship requires us to turn right back around and re-enter that pit in order to help those that are still captive within their own. So it is in this spirit that I give you the words of Psalm 40, verses 1 through 11. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the desolate pit, out of the miry bog, and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise for our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Happy are those who make the Lord their trust, who do not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after false gods. You have multiplied, O Lord my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts toward us. None can compare with you. Were I to proclaim and tell of them, they would be more than can be counted. Sacrifice and offering you do not desire, but you have given me an open ear. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. Then I said, here I am. In the scroll of the book it is written of me, I delight to do your will, O oh my God. Your law is within my heart. I have told the glad news of deliverance in the great congregation. See, I have not restrained my lips, as you know, O oh Lord. I have not hidden your saving help within my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your steadfast love and your faithfulness from the great congregation. Do not, O oh Lord, withhold your mercy from me. Let your steadfast love and your faithfulness keep me safe forever. The word of God for the people of God this day. There is a feeling of humility, even in the midst of this proclamation, here in this psalm. Psalms list God's good works in the life of an individual. God puts a song in their mouth, and God's good deeds are too numerous to count them. And to prove it, my cat ate my sermon. They put a good song in their mouth. Here is something I found interesting, though. The psalm writer rejoices that after his long period of despair in a miry bog, which, by the way, sounds like a weird drink from the movie Harry Potter, but after his despair in the miry bog, he is placed on a rock, a place of security and strength. In the Gospel of John, Jesus gives Simon a new name, Cephas, which translates to Peter, meaning rock. He becomes the rock in which Jesus will build his church. Could it be that the sturdy rock in which God sets our feet on is not a geological formation, but a body of people dedicated to the ways of Jesus? In the spring of 1985, U2, amazing band, U2, the unforgettable, unforgettable fire tour, stopped in Hartford City, Connecticut. As I was researching, I came across this story because I really do love some U2, and I was only 
four or five at the time. But 20 years after this tour, the lead singer Bono would be nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize and students of divinity would read his theology. Bono gains the audience of heads of state when he used his celebrity status to assist the poor, the poorest of the poor and the marginalized. But on that spring day in the 80s, one could hear the singer's passion for peace and justice. Now that was rock. Rock and roll with a conscience. It was music blended with deep spirituality. The final encore that evening was the song 40, which was this psalm put to music. As the band left the stage, one by one, the enthusiastic crowd continued singing the song's refrain, I will sing, sing a new song. Even as the crowds poured out of the stadium, huge bands of fans carried this tune into the city streets. This theme is well worth singing and preaching. God hears our cries, delivers us from times of trouble. So we will respond with a joyful noise, a song of praise. We will find this theme echoing through the ages, from Israel's deliverance from Exodus to the praise songs that Paul sings in prison. And now it's our turn. We need to heed the Psalms' call to personally be present with the God that draws us from our pits. I read another conversation that a pastor had with a woman who had re-entered re the church after so many years away. She spoke of her childhood congregation with deep affection, naming the people who showed her and taught her the ways of discipleship. Surprised for her obvious love of the church, the minister asked why she left it all. And she said, as I sat there week after week, it's like everybody was keeping the good stuff for themselves. It's like they knew the goodness of God, but didn't think to share it. Surely there's a good reason to draw from the riches of others. At the heart of today's psalm lies a personal account of the psalm writer's faith. How might we as individuals and the church account for our faith and the joys of life? in the midst of the trials of life. Each week, this sanctuary holds an entire catalog of redemption and songs and stories of praise. They are within each and every one of you. Can you imagine how vocally remembering them might give hope to others that a new song of praise could also be on their lips? But we also have to recognize, however, that verse 11 and the rest of the psalm after make clear that life's trials do persist. There are still some of us around the world that are waiting, waiting on deliverance, who are still crying and who are still in their pits. Families of the people from that Malaysian flight, people hungry, people in war-torn countries, Israel, Palestine, People right here in our own cities suffering crime and violence. People around this community who are hungry. The psalm calls us, when we get to those verses, to place our memories in that place of God's protection. And to prayer, prayerfully thank God and ask God for more of the same. But the psalm is written and read not only for God, but for the writer. And to all of those who hear this prayer, a remembrance of God's wondrous deeds, too many to be counted, and the grip of trouble. The writer praises God both for being yesterday's sure footing and for being the promise of tomorrow's hope. Our great hope should be that all will sing the new song of God's deliverance. In the meantime, we join the chorus of songs from faithful souls from every age who have spoken of God's steadfast love and faithfulness and have put their trust in God. Together we can tell it like it is in this congregation. 
with this congregation. We take our good news and we let it pour out into the streets like music after a Bono concert. We have to share the good stuff and not keep the best stuff for ourselves. This psalm tells us to wait intently on the Lord. When we are in the pit, we are to wait intently, and that is not an easy task. But this means is not just a sit around and feel sorry for ourselves kind of intent. We are to cry out to God. It is an active waiting, intensely waiting, praying, glorifying. And when God, in God's time, places us on that rock of security and strength, we are to magnify the Lord. Share your story. Sing your story. Go from mire to the choir. My favorite class in undergrad was my astronomy class. My dad and I have always been fascinated by the stars. Growing up five miles from NASA, we'll tend to do that to you. We used to hang out next door at our neighbor's house who used to build telescopes. And we would stare at the moon and the stars through telescopes that he made that were much more high powered than any that you could possibly buy affordably. When I took that astronomy class in college, I took it as a night class. And sometimes we got to go to the observatory and see and find the constellations, sometimes specific stars in the sky that were in various stages. Those high-powered telescopes could tell you what stage a star was in from birth to death. As you know, a telescope takes what looks a very tiny object in the night sky and magnifies it so that we can get some picture of how it really looks. With a telescope, people either ignore the star, or without a telescope, people either ignore the stars or look up and see this tiny twinkle in the sky, sometimes with a reminder to sing twinkle, twinkle, little star to their little ones. Little star? With a telescope, astronomers know that many of those stars are anything but little. Some of them dwarf our own sun, making it look like a speck of dust in comparison. There are times my friends, that God seems far away. There are times when God seems small. But we are called to magnify the Lord. We are called to be God's telescopes. Shine on and magnify. Amen.